Yes, our mind is very important. Don't let your mind run wild. You know, people's run, and their people's minds, they run before they run. So if you are confused, let's get free. I don't want to forget. Uh, we advertised about an English book that we had. We have sold thousands of copies of this daily confession. But we have been able to put out uh, a single uh, book uh, of the daily confession. So you can uh, purchase one of these also and be blessed. And uh, maybe you can talk to somebody who knows Singhalese and they might not be interested in buying the English one, but they'll be interested in the, English, uh, the Singhalese. And uh, that'll be a blessing to them too. So you can pick up one from the bookstore, bless somebody, you can take one for yourself and uh, be a blessing. Wherever you go, carry the blessing of God and speak the word of blessing over people. Speak the blessing over your surrounding. Keep your mind focused on the Lord. And these are little things that are very important. They are little, but then they bring uh, big results in life. You want big results, you've got to keep your mind. You've got to keep your mind focused on the Lord. You've got to keep your mind focused on the Lord. You cannot uh, let your mind run wild and try to bring your body under control. Your body will never be under control if your mind is running wild. You got to bring your body, uh, if you want a body under control, get your mind in line. The Bible says, he who, can contro- he who controls his mind is even stronger than one who can uh, control a city. He can, I mean, even, even, even more than taking a city, he who controls his mind is greater. So that's how important your mind is. Somebody says somebody who is powerful, he can take over a city, but then the Bible says if you can control your mind, you're a greater person than a person who can bring down a city. So keep your mind focused on the Lord. Don't ever forget your mind is with you. You've got to keep your mind with you. You know, when you're sidetracked, when you're distracted, when you're moved along with what, what, what you see around you, it can, it can uh, destroy your life. It can, it can destroy your very purpose for living because your mind has to be stayed on the Lord. It's a scripture that we sang really. Uh, it's in Isaiah chapter. That's a scripture because every song that we sing here, we make sure that it lines up with the doctrines and the scriptures. Some are prom- promises, some are based on promises, some songs are based on promises, some songs are based on uh, 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 even uh, uh, doctrines. And uh, so you got to make sure that uh, your mind is stayed on the Lord. God is, in, God is interested in keeping your mind strong. Right, so if you keep your mind strong, so it's thoughts that run in your mind. You don't have to believe every thought that comes into your life. Everything that you hear, everything that comes into your mind, you don't have to believe them. The thoughts come through various sources. One is your imaginations that you already stored, preconceived thoughts and minds. Secondly, we have thoughts coming through our emotions. Thirdly, we can have thoughts coming through our circumstances, what we see in the natural. See, the, the, I mean, the word imagination is, is an image. It creates an image. It's like your, your eyeball picks up an image, a picture, and then it makes an image, and you can imagine. Sometimes you can even, even, even make it a picture in your mind. That's an imagination. You can image something in you. So everything that you... That, you, that comes to you. And, and, and sometimes, if you really give in to wild imaginations, I mean, you believe everything and you're, you, you, you're stuck with your imagination world. And that's a perfect candidate for the enemy to speak to. And the devil, he can just add more thoughts. He can make you fearful. And the devil can bring thoughts and thoughts upon thoughts and you'll begin to see, my, I was not so bad, I was just having, but then the enemy can exaggerate and confuse your mind. And eventually, after a while, if you don't bring these things under control, they, they are, a stronghold is built in your mind. Strongholds are built in the minds of the people. And, and with these strongholds that you have built in your mind, 
you find it difficult to receive anything. When you hear even the good word of God, ah, I don't believe it. Oh yeah, I've heard it before. Because those strongholds say, yeah, yeah, you don't have to. You know, those strongholds are actually blocking you, blocking you from receiving the good word of God. So the scriptures that we, we saw, uh, that we confessed was, pull down the strongholds. Pull down the strongholds. We'll, we'll go to Isaiah 26, but before that, let's go to the book of, uh, the, the, that, that, we con, uh, that we confessed. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I like to make the word of God so interesting to you because it's not just preaching, but when you have the manual with you, you can refer it and you say, yeah, it's in the Bible. I have not seen it before. I have not read it like the way I see it now. So it's good to have the manual before you. This is a manual of life for you that you can, you can put things to work. When you have an equipment, when you get a new equipment, you immediately look for the manual. I mean, some of the things that we are used to it, so we don't look for the manual, but then most of it's something new. I mean, we don't know. We want to get it work perfectly. We don't want to damage the equipment. We, want, we don't want to abuse it. So what we do, we go to the manual. We, we, we get instructions and we get the manual and say, okay, this is this, this what I need to do. So this is the manual book for the New Testament saint, the child of God. You have the manuals laid up before you and you go through this and start seeing things differently through the scriptures. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number three, it says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk after the flesh. In other words, we are walking in the flesh. I mean, we are flesh and blood. We cannot deny that. We do things in the flesh, we move in the flesh. I mean, God has given us a flesh and body. We have bones, we have, we have, we have the blood circulations. We are flesh. We are, we are 100% flesh. But as much as we are 100% flesh, we also live in a spirit world. In the world that we don't see. The world calls it, the world says, we have an unseen enemy that is attacking us. Yeah, but we know the enemy who is attacking the whole world. We know the enemy. They may be unseen, but we know through the scriptures that we have an unseen enemy, the devil, who is a roaring lion who seeks whom he can devour. We have an unseen enemy, we don't doubt it, but we have power over the unseen enemy. Jesus said, you have, I have given you power over all the power of the enemy who is unseen really, and I have given you all the power over the unseen enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing, by no means, nothing shall hurt you. So uh, uh, that's the scripture in, 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 um, in the book of Luke chapter 10 and verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Now, who are these serpents and scorpions? These are unseen enemies that are attacking your finances, that are attacking your physical uh, status, that's attacking your, your, your relational uh, uh, relations or maybe probably the relationships that you're having in people. The enemy whispers certain things to others and, and tries to bring separation between one another. See, an unseen enemy speaks to your spouse and you don't even realize that an unseen enemy is putting thoughts into the mind of probably your spouse and you wonder, why, where, did, where did he come up with? Where has she come up with? How come I had, I had a good relationship and all of a sudden things are different now? Because there's an unseen enemy who puts thoughts because if you don't control your thoughts, the enemy is also going to add thoughts into your life and it can create havoc in the homes, probably even in relationships, friendships. God brings friendships together for the sole purpose that there might be, there might be unity and harmony amongst the brethren so that God can move through the body. He can move through one another and touch lives and bring joy to the families and joy to the lives of those who have never experienced the goodness of God. Friendships are good and all of a sudden we find friendships breaking up. Why is that? 
because there's a whisperer, an unseen enemy who goes around whispering thoughts into the minds of people and causing a division. It's not God's will. And there's a scripture where it says like this in, uh, uh, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, and verse chapter 16 and verse, so oh, where did it read? Okay, verse 28. Verse 28. A forward man soweth strife. A crooked person, he sows strife. Goes around, I mean, talking things that they should not, where they don't have any business. They just go and stir up the minds of the people and cause divisions to come upon people. A whisperer separated chief friends. I mean, chief friends, good friends. Their, their, their friendship is based on, on nothing apart from being good to one another and to be a blessing to somebody else. With no ulterior motives, they have built their friendships. And, and those are healthy friendships, I would say. You have, you have friends, you have built your friendship for the last so many years, and none of them, they personally they have any ulterior motive behind. How could I scrape that person off from something that he or she has? How can I pull something? My friendship is only based on what I can get. That's not friends. That's not being a true friend. It's only a friend who really sticks by you, who is, who is close to you, even closer than a brother. The Bible talks about a friend who would stick closer than a brother to you, one who encourages, one who is always in assistance to you, one who corrects you, one who rebukes you. You know, that's a good friend. Or you want friends who would always approve what you do. I don't think he's a good friend. You might, you might have some... And, and you, if you have a true friend who has a right over your life by means of uh, friendship, by means of not, not, not in a way that he or she tries to control your personal decisions, but then somebody who has been a friend to you who is faithful. We talk about a friend and we, we add a word, very important word, somebody who is faithful can can be a blessing to you when, you when you bring up a thought or when you bring up something saying, I should be doing this. And if you're a, if you're a good friend, then, and you will say, no, that's, that's not a good thing that you're about to do. It's a wrong, it's a wrong thing. It's a wrong thing. You should, you should keep away. And uh, that's something that, that people need to realize and, and build their friendships on. And there are good friends that we can, we can really be a blessing to one another. If you think you're a strong character, find somebody whom you can be a blessing to, not using your strength to get your personal needs met or, some, or, or, or try to uh, take advantage of, but because you're strong enough or you're, you're, you're having more wisdom that somebody who, is, who, who has a little knowledge of God's word and understanding, you can be a strength to that person. Eventually, both of you will be strong together. And the Bible says, iron sharpeneth iron. Through friendships, you find that you can, an iron can sharpen an, another iron. It's in the book of Ephesians, I'm sorry, in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10, I believe. And uh, it's wis wisdom is good. Proverbs, is it Proverbs? Put that scripture, okay. Proverbs 27 and verse 17, that's right. And there's also another scripture in 10. Uh, uh, we'll read Proverbs, yeah. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of a friend. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of a friend. Let me tell you, if you are not having a good countenance, I know, I can see the friends that you have around you. That friend only approves what you're doing and that friend always is a friend who is flatters. He's not a person who sharpens your countenance. So man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Healthy friendships 
would always cause you to have a, a beautiful countenance. And, and, and people would see somebody good is behind you. Your spouse could be the best friend of yours. Somebody who is very near to you who is not a, a non-interfering person in your personal decisions to the extent where he only has his opinion or he is an influence, a good influence to you. Now, that's very important. I don't want to speak the other side of it, but I, I just want to stick there. Because it's good to have good friends who are, I mean, where you, yeah, you can get your countenance sharpened. Because you'll be somebody who is really, a friend who really is a true friend, is not somebody who is betraying you all the time and who, who downgrades you, who puts you down and makes you feel weary. No, he sharpens you. Come on, you can do it. Let's do it together. I had the similar situation that I went through, but this is what I did, and this is how the Lord worked in my life, and let's do it. Let's encourage. But if you, if you add a wrong friend into this friendship, you will have somebody who would sow discord among brethren. If you have the wrong person, when you have a wrong person come into your life, and uh, from day one onwards, you would find that this person would be in your heart for the only purpose so that you would trust this person to the extent where whatever he or she says goes in your life. Right? So what happens is, if you have an unhealthy friendship, it can destroy your good friends. And you can move away from good friends and you wouldn't be able to know who your good friends are and who your bad friends are. And you'll be so blinded because somebody has, somebody is working in your mind and, and uh, it's causing you to be double-minded and then eventually most, most of the time it's, it's a dark, dark side of the picture that we always believe than something that is better, something that is right. So watch out for unhealthy people who come by your way and put thoughts. Now let me show you an, uh, something from the book of Proverbs. And in Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6, it's talking about six things that the Lord hates. And the seventh thing that the Lord despises and he calls it an abomination. Right? So I would like to just share those things just to encourage you while we are enjoying the sermon here. Verse number 16 says, these six things the Lord hates. I mean, even the world would hate that. These are usual things. These six things the Lord hates. Yea, seventh, the word seventh there also can be added as the word seventh, are an abomination to him. Six things is something that the Lord hates, but when it goes one, one more step further, it's an abomination. It stinks in his nostrils. He aboreth it. He says, that's something that I hate. Verse number 17. Verse number yeah, 17. A proud look, God hates. A lying tongue, God hates. And hands that shed innocent blood, God hates. A heart that devises wicked imaginations, God hates. Feet that is swift to running to mischief, God hates. A false witness that speaks lies, God hates. And the seventh is he that sow a discord among brethren. If you have entertained somebody who comes into your life and who always sows a seed or bring words to discord, to dis divide, to, to split, to bring quarrel amongst your brethren, somebody who has been a true friend to you for all these years, and somebody who have entertained some unhealthy friendship that has caused you to let discord enter or strife and quarrel, some thoughts concerning your brother enter, and all of a sudden, you are mean to this person who has been so friendly to you, who has, been, who has not had anything. 
has no part at all of your life concerning except for something that is good for your life. And, and you have just allowed thoughts to come into your mind and you divide yourself from that brother or the friend because somebody who tells you, somebody has won your heart and somebody who flatters and, and comes and tells you thoughts, you've got to be watchful. Now, these are, I, I encourage you to read the book of Proverbs. Very, very practical book. It will really help you. It will help you a lot in, in, uh, in every way. You can always be blessed by reading the book of Proverbs because there is so much that you can learn from the book of Proverbs. It's not just simple general knowledge, but it is a wisdom from, all, from Almighty God. General knowledge can take you far, but then not as far as the Proverbs that God is revealing through, uh, uh, through the Holy Spirit that can really uh, help you I mean, it has helped me in building good friendships and it has also helped me to see unhealthy friends whom I, 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 not that I don't love them, but I keep my arm's length. But I know, I I just don't let them rule my life. I I have friends, I don't let them control my life. We we, we have friends, but we we don't have that friendship to the extent where I'm bound to the friend. I'm bound. No, you cannot be bound. It should be a, a very a healthy friendship that you will always be able to finally make your decision so that you would say, it's not because of him or her, it's I who made this decision. It, was it a bad or a good decision? That's having a good character in you so that you wouldn't blame your friend all the time, or he made me do it, he did it, he said this to me and I did it just because. No, you will have that friendship continually, but you will never take the, put the blame on somebody else. Eventually you will say, yeah, it's I. It's always good, when you make a mistake, say, yes, I made a mistake, I'm at fault. Uh, if, if, it has, if it is concerning a person, you go to that person and confess your faults one to another. And then if it is something to do with the Lord, you can also tell, Lord, forgive me. I have betrayed a brother or I have done something that is wrong. And you can receive forgiveness from the Lord too. And you can just walk free from condemnation. You don't have to walk in condemnation. You can just walk in free from condemnation. Be free from condemnation. Right. So thoughts that are running in your mind, you've got to make sure that you bring them down. You don't let those thoughts run you wild and make you just do things and then make a mess of your life. You know, thoughts are very important, but having the right thoughts is very much important because if you have a wrong thought coming in your mind, if you build yourself upon the wrong thoughts, you will face the consequences. You will face the consequences. That's the reason the Bible says, lean not unto your own understanding. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. My own understanding may, may tell me something, but then God has something better for you. Sometimes we settle for the least instead of trusting him for the best. You know, trusting him has a lot to do with time, with attitudes. Having a, having a grateful attitude of thanking him and waiting for the perfect timing that God has. He does some things at the perfect time. And I'm thankful, walking with the Lord for the last so many years, for 30 some years, And I thank God that I didn't get what I wanted at the times that I really, you know, my flesh wanted it. But I waited. And I waited and the Lord has blessed. So everything, in in every way, I, I really thank God. I mean, so trust in the Lord with all your heart, with all your heart reserving nothing for yourself. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on to your own understanding. You know, yeah, the Lord said, but I should be, after all, we, we have common sense. I mean, people are living by their common sense and they're making a mess of their lives. Sometimes you've got to be a fool for Jesus to have the wisdom of God. 
It's foolishness sometimes. When, when you do certain things in your life and then people look at you and say, you're the only one I have not seen anybody else making these decisions like the way you make. Sometimes you've got to be a fool to receive the wisdom of God. Let me show you that scripture because sometimes you might say, what? Have I got to be a fool to receive? Yeah, you've got to be a fool to understanding the world's way. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and uh, it says, or maybe 3, I believe, 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And verse number 18. Let no man deceive himself. Don't be deceived. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seems to be wise in this world, we have a lot of wisdom that we have received from the world, from our academics. We have received a lot of wisdom, a lot of understanding. We probably, we kind of think we know it all. I mean, we, no, we don't know it all. The wisdom of the world means nothing. Let him become a fool that he may be wise. There are lots of people who are wise in this world, in the world's way and understanding and despising even the wisdom of God. And if you really want to be a wise person, you might have to become a fool to some of the things that you have in your mind. I'm going to say, oh no, I don't want to be a foolish man. No, it's not talking about foolish. It's simply being, you've got to be numb to some of the things that you have learned from the world. And you can easily know some of those people who are practicing the wisdom that the world has provided for them, they are not doing too well. They've destroyed themselves. You've got to become a fool for Christ. And say, Lord, I, I may be a fool at this, in this stage, but God says, I'm going to really let you know that my wisdom is far greater than the wisdom of the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24 and verse 25, because the foolishness of God, can you imagine the foolishness of God, the crucifixion of Christ is foolishness. The crucifixion of Christ is foolishness. How can one man die 2,000 years ago and what influence can that bring into my life? That's foolishness in the eyes of people. They say, you're a fool to believe Jesus who died 2,000 years ago and you mean to say he has risen from the dead and now he lives inside of you and you want to talk like him and act like him and do things like him? Are you living by the same power? Foolish man, you're a fool to believe that. You're a fool to believe that. The foolishness of God, that's a foolish thought in the eyes of the people. They say you're following something that is. It's now that they realize they have an unseen enemy after so many years. They say we have an unseen enemy. But thank God for the wisdom that we have. We not only know that we have an unseen enemy, but we also know that a God whom we have not seen and we believe in, who has put so much of joy into our lives and also have given us, given us courage and boldness over the unseen enemy. You think that is wisdom? Or the people who now say, oh, I think we are going through an unseen enemy. If you have an unseen enemy and you have nothing to do about it, you're really in, on danger ground. Thank God for his wisdom. Thank God for his life. Thank God for his goodness. Thank God he has given us all authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt us. You're a powerful fool. You're a powerhouse, I'll tell you one thing. You're a powerhouse. You have the life of God inside of you. In Colossians, in the book of Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20, uh, yeah, verse 23, I believe. Oh no, it's 
First Peter, I'm sorry. It's in First Peter. First Peter chapter number one. Okay. Right. First Peter chapter number one and verse number six. Verse number eight. Now it's talking about Jesus Christ and God. In verse number eight, it says, Whom having not seen, whom having not seen, you love him. You don't see him with your physical eyes, but you love him. Your love for the Lord has to do with everything that he has said in his word. You love him. That's why you read the Bible. You love him. That's why you come to church. You love him because... You, you, you wake up in the morning, that attachment of love is with you, in you. You love him. You wake up in the morning and say, thank you, Jesus, for a good night's sleep. And you go to bed in, at night and say, thank you, Lord, for giving me a good night's sleep. And at noontime, you praise the Lord. And in the morning, you read the Bible instead of looking at the newspapers and all the bad news. And, and, and every time you're, you're focused on what God says, when you, even at daytime when you hear the, the, the voice of the enemy, when thoughts still come and you always refute those thoughts and say, no, I, don't, I, I, I refuse them, I, I don't want them. You take the shield of faith and say, no, I don't believe those thoughts that are coming into my mind, I'm refusing them. Whom having not seen, you love. In whom, though you now see him not yet, you believe him. You don't see him, but you believe him. That's the reason you, you, you do things. Yes, I know. I don't see my God, but I know I love him and I believe in him. I love him and I believe in him. If you say that you love God, you're also believing him. I don't see him, but I believe him. I know that God loves me and I love him and we have a love relationship between one another and I believe everything that he says. That's the reason you listen to the Bible, you read the Bible, you hear and you believe. You, when, when you see things in the natural that the unseen enemy is doing, you would still say, God, I thank you for the protection that you've given me. I thank you, Lord. I believe, Lord, that you're with me and no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper Every tongue that is rising up against me, I condemn it. I refuse to accept those thoughts that are coming against my mind. I am yet believing. I don't see him. You rejoice with a joy unspeakable, full of joy. In fact, in fact, this scripture should just should make you so rejoice and say, God, I just love you. People, the world is talking about an unseen enemy. But Lord, I have a God whom I don't see in the natural, but I know who lives inside of me. I love you, Lord. I believe in you. And I'm rejoicing in you. I'm rejoicing. You know, joy is very important for you. It's just joy and laughter. You might say, oh, yeah, I don't feel like I'm just waiting for an impression to laugh. I, I, I'm waiting for some kind of a thing. Nothing. You, don't, you can just laugh if you want to. How come people cry when they receive bad news? Why don't you laugh? Because you have some good news with you. And do you know that you can laugh all the time? You can just rejoice all the time. And it's good medication. Proverbs 17 and verse number 22 says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. A merry heart does good like a medicine. If you're having a merry heart, let your face know it. Let your countenance know it and, and be joyful. Not because of what's happening around, but for who you are and who your God is and whom you serve. You rejoice with an unspeakable joy. You rejoice the unspeakable joy that is full of glory. You and I are supposed to be people so different. I mean, you're just, you're just injecting medication into your body by rejoicing in the Lord. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. A merry heart good, doeth good like a medicine. So keep yourself in the position that you're always going to laugh and let your countenance know that you have a merry heart. 
I think in chapter 16 it says, Proverbs chapter 16, let your face know it. Chapter 15 and verse number 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. Why don't you let your face know that you're having a merry heart? The reason you have a merry heart is not because of anything of what you have done or what you have received or what you have not received. It's because Jesus has saved your life and you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Your sins are washed away and you're a citizen of heaven. You have eternal life in you. That should be the merry heart that you have. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. You know, you have to put on to be an angry character. You really have to put on to be an angry character because you are afraid that somebody can be vicious towards you. Somebody can control you because if you don't show that, you know, face off. You know, it says, I mean, some people say, well, if, you're, if, you, if you show yourself too merry, I mean, people take advantage of you and they would think that you're a very loose character and you, no, not at all. Not at all. They kind of think, you know, if, if, you, sh- if, if you don't be rigid and, and put rules and regulations and be like an OYC at home, I mean, I mean, I'm in charge of the whole thing, I mean. The people would be, I mean, you, you're trying to intimidate them, but you're not intimidating them. You're only causing disaster. Instead, be a joyful character. Because in the book of Nehemiah, it says, in the book of Nehemiah, it says in chapter 8 and verse number 10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do you know that a joyful person is more stronger than a person who puts on an angry face. A joyful person is strong because it says the joy of the Lord is going to be your strength. He said, when people were finding it so difficult to rejoice, the preacher said, then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord, neither be ye sorry. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Be joyful. That's a wonderful character. God is a God of joy. He's not a God of sorrow. In fact, the Bible says, in his presence there is fullness of joy. In his presence there is fullness of joy. So we don't have to put on what we are really not. We have to put on to be a a strong character like, you know, to let people know that you're strong in the outside. You don't have to be strong in the outside. You can be strong within you. A strong character. A person with a strong character. You can't even see. You you may think that he, he looks a weak character, but a strong character is one who is really rejoicing all the time. Because number one is you're having medication. I mean, you can have, medication has been, imp, uh, I mean, injected into your body. And one thing is your body is going to stay fresh and, and your body is going to be strong. And secondly, you have the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. And thirdly, your, your bones are not going to get um, uh, destroyed. But they're going to be, they're going to receive the marrow by being, by rejoicing in the Lord. There is joy. It says in Proverbs 14 and verse number 30, a sound heart is, a sound heart is the life of the flesh. But envy and rotten, uh, envy, the rottenness of bones. You don't want to be having rottenness of bones. And also the one that we read before, Proverbs 15 and verse 13, it says, but sorrow of heart is a broken spirit. So it's it's affecting your life. And also the other word that we read in, in Proverbs 17 and verse 22, but a broken spirit dries up the bones, all kinds of bone diseases is upon people who are sorrowful. 
and through which many, many of the diseases are caused by the bone diseases. Many. If, you're, if you don't keep your bones right, then you're going to have other diseases coming through into your life. So keep yourself joyful. Don't be sorrowful. Keep yourself joyful because in God's presence there is fullness of joy always. Have a happy countenance. Let your face know that you're joyful. Let your face know that you're joyful, okay? So, so be joyful because we, we know the source of life. Although it's, he is unseen to us, it has been revealed. All things have been revealed unto us by the scriptures, by the Holy Spirit. Things are revealed unto us, right? So going back again to the book of... Uh, 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 the book that we were reading in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Every time you have a, a flesh confrontation, you always try to confront it with flesh, through fleshly words, attack somebody through words, speak at somebody, because you feel you won the war. You won the fight by being in an argument, being stronger, in control, in words. But then, although we walk in the flesh, our war is not in the flesh. We have a war. But it's not in the flesh. If you realize it's not in the flesh, it has to be in the spiritual realm, in your mind. So how do you attack it? In the mind. So you, 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 have, you have to have a spiritual mind to discern things and say, no, I'm just, now somebody is against me, I'm going to oppose that person, I'm just going to be mad at this person, I'm going to, I'm going to be so rigid and I'm going to be... I'm going to be an enemy to this person. I'm going to do some, I'm going to be revengeful. I'll just see. An eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. I see that. I do something. And, and you know God is love and you can't say, God curse that person. You may not say that. Or you might say, oh, uh, maybe God won't do it, but I'll do it. But the strongest way that you can overcome is not by fly, fighting in the flesh. Argument can lead to another argument. Can lead to another argument. And, and, and there is no end until you feel, oh, I feel I'm okay now. I, I've already won the, won the argument. But you didn't find, the, although you won the argument, you never won the battle. You lost the battle. We do not war after the flesh. Verse number four says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons that we use for warfare are not carnal. They're not carnal. It means they're not fleshly. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. Number one, it says, but mighty through pulling down, through God in pulling down strongholds. Who is God? God is a spirit. So we could read the scripture like this. Mighty through the spirit in pulling down strongholds, mighty through the spirits in pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations. You got to make sure these imaginations, arguments that are running in your mind has to be brought down, casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is God's scriptures, the word. The knowledge of God is how God speaks to you in your inner man. Any thought that is in your mind which is contrary to the thoughts, to the word of God, you've got to pull them down. Demolish them, destroy them. Fearful thoughts, sorrowful thoughts, anxiety, worry. You've got to say, no, I'm not going to entertain such things. When I see my future, I see that God has created a beautiful future for me. I don't see a bad future. If God has brought me thus far, then he's able to keep me even in the future. And the plans that God has for you are plans that are good. In Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11, 
It says, the thoughts that I think towards you are thoughts of peace. And God says, I know. He says, I know. God says, I know it all. I'm telling, God says, let me just impart this to you. I know what I'm thinking about you. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. You might say, nobody cares for me. Nobody is even interested about me. I don't, I don't even imagine that anybody in this world, maybe nobody in this world, but then you have somebody who's inside of you who's always having thoughts concerning your life. And that's God himself. I know the thoughts. That word thoughts there also means plans. I know the plans that I have for you. And, and, to, and the Lord says, I, have, I know the plans that I think towards you. And they are plans of peace. Plans are always for the future. Something that, you're going to, that you don't see in the natural, that you don't see now. But God says, I have good plans for you. Plans of peace. And that word peace means shalom in, in Hebrew. We don't know Hebrew and Greek, but we have assistance and we use them. And the word shalom means peace, prosperity, wholeness, deliverance, calmness. I mean, that's, it includes everything. He said, I have thoughts of peace for you and prosperity for you and not of evil. Nobody cares for me. That's the biggest lie that you have ever said that has come from the pits of hell. God cares about you. God has thoughts about your life. And he has not thought of anything evil. God says, I don't have any evil plans for you. I don't want you to be sick in your body. I don't want you to be poor in your life. I don't want you to be a pauper. I don't want you to be some kind of a person who is just trying to make ends meet. I'm not, I'm not thinking about you being insulted by the world and being ashamed and you being my child and how can I bear to see my child barely getting along with things? That's not the heart of God. It's a shame for God when his children are not doing well. It's a shame for God. I mean, you find somebody walking on the road and you find my you news, know, this guy, he's, I know who his father is, I know who, how his brothers are. He's a well-to-do person, but why is he walking like this and feeling that he's just like a pauper? It's a shame to the family. And God does not want you to understand. God doesn't want you to think that he has bad thoughts for your life. He has good thoughts for your life. To give you an expected end. What are you expecting? What are you expecting? If you talk to a, to a mother who is pregnant, I'm expecting a child. I'm expecting a wonderful child. To give you an expected end. To give you a wonderful end that after a while when you, when you reach to some extent of your life you will turn behind and say, oh God, I thank you that you've been so good to me all these years, even through the financial crisis, even through the pestilent crisis. You've been so good to me. You've been so faithful to me. You kept me strong. You kept me healthy. Lord, I'm so grateful to you because the Bible says in Psalm 23 and verse number. Two good friends are going to follow you all the days of your life. And you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that's goodness and mercy. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Whenever you turn around you can say, oh goodness and mercy. They're all who are following me. I don't see any badness. I don't see any mercilessness that is happening in my life. I only see goodness and mercy following me all the days of my life. And I shall, for that reason, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. I won't backslide. I won't turn away from God. 
I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The house is not simply only a building, but the house is, you're going to stay tuned to the voice of God. Somebody who is in the house of the Lord is somebody who is an obedient child to the Father. Obedience. Any, any house that you live in and you have the authority in the house, you're supposed to be living, you're supposed to be submitted or you're supposed to be obedient. So in the house of God, God is your father. And you're an obedient child in the house of God forever. Forever. You don't have a disobedient nature. You're going to be so obedient to the Lord all the days of your life. All the days of your life. Forever. I'm in the house of God. Because I only see goodness and mercy following me. God doesn't have anything bad to give you. God does not have anything bad to give you. At the end of the insurance cover, they say, we don't cover for the acts of God. And they blame God for all the disaster. That's a big lie. We don't cover. They can't even cover for the things that are happening around. What are they talking about? Acts of God. And the acts of God are only what Christ has done for us. And he always does good. And you don't have to pay for anything. That's the reason I always encourage people to walk in assurance than to walk in insurance. Insurance only pays after the tragedy, but assurance will keep you from tragedy. Hmm? Isn't that better? To live all the days of our lives having the assurance in the Lord. I mean, they, they tried to sell me into that. They came and said, you don't know what's going to happen to you. Um, long years back, when people used to come to my office and they say, we have a good plan for you. I said, okay, let me show you. I knew, I, I knew the plan that I had already uh, for my life. He says, you don't know what's going to happen to you tomorrow. And they started talking about all the things. And you should get yourself covered. I said, I'm already covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. What? Who is your doctor? I said, Jesus Christ. So you, you're a Christian. I said, yeah, I am. But then I, I, I'm, a, I'm a believing Christian, not just. Uh, my father had done this for me a long time ago and he had put life insurance for me and then I had to go to the doctor. And when I went to the doctor and he started questioning me, he said, who's your family doctor? I said, my, personally, my doctor is Jesus. He said, you go and he signed and sent me off. I believe in Jesus. So he thought he's just talking to now. He's going to talk to a nut. He didn't want to waste his time. That's okay, I'm still strong. I don't know whether he's living now. I'm still going strong. And I intend living according to the word of God. A long life. The Bible talks about a long life. In Psalm 91, he says the promising scripture that is in Psalm 91 and verse number 16. He says, because you love me and because of the love relationship that we have between each other, I will satisfy you with long life. I will satisfy you with long life, long life, long life, a very long life, not dragging about, oh my God, I'm sick and I feel so weary, I wonder when is God going to take me home, you don't have to live like that, he said, I'll satisfy you, I'll keep you satisfied with long life and show you my salvation, salvation, deliverance, you know, it's, it's, it's nice for us to live, to be in assurance, to have full assurance in God. It's good. And God can show you his salvation every day. He delivers you. He protects you. He guards you. The only thing that he wants you to do is be thankful. Don't be a grumpy character. Don't be a complaining person. Just be thankful to him. Because your next breath comes from the one who loves you. That should give you an assurance that he has a beautiful future for me. And the plans that he has for me are good and not evil. Plans of peace, not of evil. You should be always thankful to the Lord. I thank God. People say, I don't know if, they, if God is alive. If he's alive, he should be doing that. See, you're not... God is not your servant boy and you're not his Lord. He is Lord. Number one, you've got to acknowledge him as Lord. God is not our servant boy. Oh, Lord, do this, do this, do this, do this, Lord. 
He says, I'm your father. And I'm not only your father, I'm a loving father. I'm an everlasting father. I'm your counselor. I'm your guide. I'm everything. I'm all in all to you. And he, he, he said, if you can believe me, and he said, you believe your natural fathers, you ask for bread and they don't give you a rock. You don't ask for fish and they don't give you a scorpion. You don't ask for, you don't ask for fish and they give you a serpent. And if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will your heavenly father give to those that ask good things? In Matthew it says good things and in Luke it says the Holy Spirit and that's the best you can receive from. If you have the Holy Spirit, you'll receive everything. Oh, praise God. I think... I want to start my sermon, but I'm just going to close my sermon. That doesn't rhyme too well, I know. But I couldn't preach what I wanted to preach. But I just touched on things that are very important in our lives. Don't have any unhealthy relationships, unhealthy friends. Keep your mind focused on the Lord. And I just want to close with this scripture from... uh, Isaiah 26 and verse 3. Thou will keep him at perf- thou will keep him in perfect peace. You will keep him at perfect peace, or peace upon peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. Keep your mind on him. If you will keep your mind in him, that is, whose mind is stayed on the Lord. It's, it's one of the words that I really, long years back when I studied that word, I understood. It's like God has a very soft heart. Such a soft heart he has. You can just Take this brain of yours and put it into him. It just absorbs that brain of yours. So what he says is, he's so soft, you can just take your mind and put it into him and let it be there. Whose mind is stayed on the Lord. I mean, so soft is he that you can just Put your brain there, your mind, and you can just put it in him. Lord, let this mind be, because I can't control my mind myself, but I want to just keep my mind in you. It's like, you know, you take something that is hard and put it into a, into a place where, I mean, where there is wool or something like that, or some kind of a cotton or some kind of wool there. Just place it into, and it gets into him. That's why he wants you to just get into him And so trust him so that you will be at perfect peace. Perfect peace is peace, peace, and peace. That's all. There's nothing other than peace with no distraction at all. No distraction at all whose mind is stayed on the Lord. And that's one of the best ways I can explain to you that scripture that I know of up to now. God has a very soft heart and let our mind be just put into that softness and all the time we would be at peace heavenly father I pray in Jesus name if somebody has lost their peace just by believing something that is not in existence something that can never happen and we know fear is deception fear can take away somebody's peace And I pray and I bind the foul spirits of fear and I take authority over those evil spirits, thoughts, of uncleanness. I bind those spirits that have been causing all this peacelessness and nightmares and fearful thoughts. I take authority over those spirits and I bind them and I cast them out 
in the name of Jesus Christ. I cast those spirits out in Jesus' name. Father God, I pray in Jesus' name that your peace flourish, flood through the minds of these dear ones. The world knows only upon, uh, about an unseen enemy that is causing all this disaster. But Lord, we thank you. You have already proved over and over again and you have revealed all that mystery to us concerning this unseen enemy who is defeated, who was defeated on the cross and who is now defeated. And you said that you shall tread upon your unseen enemies and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Lord, we thank you for the wisdom that you've given the church, the body of Christ, the body of believers. Not only about the unseen enemy who's defeated, but to overcome the unseen enemy who comes up with this bag of tricks of fear and deception. We resist those thoughts. We have an unseen God whom we love and whom we believe. With unspeakable joy and full of glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for keeping us at perfect peace, keeping us in the perfect will of God that is to be in peace. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake in the covenant meal. Thank you, Father. Praise your glorious name. Praise your glorious name. Praise your glorious name. 
Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for the words of life and the promises that you have given us that we can have our assurance in your words and the eternal life that you've given us. Oh, we're so thankful to you, Lord. We're thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that none of our good works was able to bring us to the place that we are right now in. It's only because of the blood of Jesus Christ that we have been sanctified, cleansed, purified, washed, purged our old conscience, our evil conscience by your blood. Sacrifice, you made a covenant with us. We are so thankful to you for your death. We are thankful to you for the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We honor you this day and we thank you and we partake of this covenant meal. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Father. Amen. Let's partake together. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We glorify your blessed name. Thank you for healing our bodies. Thank you for strengthening us. Thank you for the shield of protection that you give us. Lord, you said that we had the blessing of Abraham. And you said the blessing of Abraham is a shield of protection from all harm and danger. You're our shield who, who is before us and around us. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for healing our bodies, strengthening our minds, bring our mind under control because you have given us a sound mind, a spirit of self-control that you've given us. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for healing our bodies. Thank you for strengthening us. Thank you for the joy that is bubbling in our hearts, which is our strength. Thank you, Father, for the broken, broken bones that have been healed. Thank you for the marrow. Thank you for healing all our bone diseases, ones that have not been able to be identified. Lord, we thank you for all internal organs that you have healed right from the head to the tip of our toe, Lord. Millions of members in our body. Lord, we thank you for healing every one of them and enabling us to walk perfectly, think perfectly, walk in divine health and be a blessing to the world. Our hands are a blessing to the world. Our words are a blessing to the world. You sent your word to bring healing upon the nations. So, Lord, even in this nation, we thank you, Lord, for using each and every one of us. Those who are viewing and those who view later, that wherever they are, in whatever part of the world they are, that they would carry the word of God. Lord, you sent your world and you, word and you healed them. And you delivered them from their destructions by sending your word through your believers. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's come before the Lord and honor him with our tithes and our offerings and give unto the Lord as the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and as you purpose in your heart and God will honor you as you give. You are
Praise God. Father, we thank and praise you for this blessed morning. And Lord, we round up in this noon time. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your love and your abundance of God, for all the good that you've done for us. We thank you for the instructions. We thank you for the guidance. We thank you for the strengthening. We thank you for encouraging us. We thank you for the words of life. We thank you, Lord, and we honor you this day, Father, for all that you've done for us. And we, even as we look to you and we say thank you, thank you, thank you. And Lord, even as... Each and every one of us have honored you with our tithes and our offerings unto you. Said, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, men shall give unto your bosom. Father, let them have favor upon favor wherever they go, Father. Let them experience the goodness of God, the love of God, the peace of God. And Lord, let the windows of heavens always be open unto them. Wherever they go, they would stay under the open heavens of God. That they would have favor upon favor. Wherever they go, Lord, your blessing is upon their lives. Thank you, Father, for protecting them from all harm and danger. Because you are a good God. You always meet their needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. And if you need a single use copy, of this book, you can purchase it from downstairs and give to somebody or read it yourself. And also, it can be an encouragement. You can encourage others also by reading this. God bless. God bless.